Are you ready for some football? Yeah. Yeah. It's only a couple of weeks away. The thing is, I'm not sure I'm ready for some football. In fact, I'm also not sure I'm ready for the reflection today either. My religion approached me about talking to the reflection a long time ago. And even then, I said, well, I don't know if I want to do it because I just don't know if I'll be able to prepare something and do a good job preparing it. But they took care of the whole thing. Myra, he, he made me feel so much better. He said, don't worry. We booked you for August and no one's going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> and someone's going to show up. You know that. So then he said, well, don't worry. You're not going to listen to me. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'm your guy. That sounds perfect. Thank you. As I predicted, some of you did show up and you are paying attention for a minute or two. <laughs> and I wish you would stop that, please. <laughs> because the fact is, I really do have some doubts about my uh, topic today and the quality of the reflection. Because as you probably figured out, I'm going to be talking about football. Yeah. <laughs> now, the good news is, if you're someone who has no interest or passion for football whatsoever, you have nothing to worry about because I am not going to stand up here and drone all about how great this game is. The bad news is, if you are someone who loves football, if you are passionate about the game, we're the end of You're probably going to be a little bit because I'm not going to drone on about how great the game is. Because the thing is, um, I want you to keep in mind before you go to that. As they say, the views expressed here today do not necessarily express the views of the manager. <laughs> or my random. I love football. Can I just say that right up front? I played when I was a kid. I still like to play now when I can find a way to make that happen. I've been watching it since before I even knew why the cheerleaders dressed that way. <laughs> And I still love you. And that's part of the problem. Because I'm beginning to think that the game that I've been obsessed with for all my life, the one that is a multi-billion dollar industry in our country, and really our true national pastime, I'm beginning to think it's, kind of, it's committing unsportsmanlike conduct. And I'm concerned that the game may be flawed. Deeply flawed, flawed more so than we realize and maybe even more so than we want to know. Okay, so now you know I'm going to be dissing football, so you got your cell phone or you got your cell phone. Um, one of the biggest problems I have with football is one of the most obvious ones, even to the non-fan. It's so darn dangerous. Now, to be fair, we know that injuries can occur in any sport. I know a fan who got hurt by who's trying to do the weight. But football is unique among sports both because of the magnitude of the collisions and because of the frequency. For example, researchers have found out that the typical collision between two players occurs at a speed of about 20 miles an hour. Have you ever had a fender bender before? You know that's a little bit uncomfortable. But by placing sensors in the helmets of football players, they've also been able to figure out that some of the concluded, concluded, concluded <laughs> collisions are more closer to what we would experience during a severe car wreck. That's a little more serious. Now you factor in that in the course of a typical game, a player will have about 50 collisions of varying magnitude over the course of that game. They'll play about 16 games in the regular season, preseason, practice, and postseason. That's a lot of collisions. That's more collisions than you're going to see in a high school parking lot, or even in seniors for that the effects of these killers. <laughs> oh, step on someone there, sorry. The effects of the collisions are pretty clear. One study that was done of 870 former NFL players, two thirds of the players reported that the injuries they had experienced as a pro made it more difficult for them to do recreational activities now that they were retired. One of the most common problems they talked about was our drugs. But another one they talked about was something called. Avascular necrosis, or AVN. That's caused by repeated trauma to the hip bone. Over time, all that trauma causes the blood circulation to the hip bone to be reduced and eventually become.
cut off completely. And when that happens, you're going to house. As you might guess, that's a little more serious than having some aches in your aches in your, in your joints. But beyond the statistics, beyond the science, are the stories of the actual players, the men who have played this game. There is, for example, Johnny Unitas. He's considered one of the greatest quarterbacks in the history of the game, a legend. But when he was playing, he suffered an injury and he was hit on his right elbow. Today, he's got nerve damage in that right arm. And now, not only can he no longer grip a football, he also can't grip a coffee cup, a cone, even his toothbrush. There's an all pro lineman named Joe Jacoby. He spent years one of the most uh, big linemen. He's got pain in his back from the injury from the cross of the game. He says the pain in his back now is so bad that sometimes it shoots down into his testicles. And there's a lineman named Kurt Marsh. And you're probably not familiar to us. He's had more than 20 operations. 13 of them were on his right ankle alone. They did one more operation on that right ankle. That's when the doctor said, this is hopeless, and they continue. And there's Jerome Campbell. He's a great running back. He played for the University of Texas and for the Houston Oilers. Almost all of you are going to recognize that name. He's got severe arthritis now in both his hands and in his knees. And as a result of nerve damage he experienced in his legs, he now has a condition called drop foot. That means that when he walks, he's no longer able to raise the fronts of his feet. So now, when the camel tries to go up or down the stairs, he cannot use his hands to grip. He can't bend his knees, so he drags himself with his forearms. But as tragic as those stories are, it's only part of what would be called the injury report. Because football, as we are beginning to learn, is even more destructive to a player's brain than it is to his body. There have been some protestations about this from the NFL. They insist there's no correlation. But researchers have pretty well established that there's a pretty clear link between the brain trauma a football player experiences and long-term neurodegenerative disease. Among other findings, they reported that of a study of 2,500 retired NFL players, the players who had at least three concussions in the course of their career had tripled the risk and again, behind the science and the statistics is the stories of the actual players. There's a guy named Dave Cacourt, never heard of him before. He played in the 60s. The dimension he developed as an adult, as a retired player, at least two occasions, his wife had to call the cops to say, I don't know where he is. A couple of days after that, she walked into the bathroom and found him getting ready to brush his teeth with his razor. Dave now lives in the There's also a former quarterback called Jim McMahon. He was at my house because I'm a Bears fan. And now, Jim carries in his wallet a card that has all of his personal information on it. So if he's out and he's disoriented, he can pull that out and he can help figure out how to get home. And his wife keeps the home alarm home at all times in case Jim accidentally wanders out of the house, she'll know about it. Now, some of you have already had experiences of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and other types of dementia, and all this stuff might be familiar territory to you. The thing is, the man is only 54 years old. And there are players whose stories are even more tragic. For example, there's former linebacker Junior Seau. Some of you are going to recognize that. He was an all pro, a great player, but he is also known as one of the most, most gregarious and jovial players of the league. Truly a funny guy. He died at age 43 after shooting himself in the chest. The doctors later confirmed that Seau had suffered from chronic, see if I can say this correct, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE, which is a long way of saying he had brain damage. It's also been found in many other football players who are nemesis. And there's another one of my heroes in defense of safety called Dave Dewars. Like Stuart Sayal, he also was an all pro player. But before he went on to become a pro football player, he was on the National Honor Society. He was a member of a program called 
the musical ambassadors of all American things. They graduated from Notre Dame University with honors with a degree in economics. This is no doubt. And of course, like Sayo, Dorison also shot himself in the chest. But before he did that, he sent a text to his family. He asked them to donate his brain to be given the science. And specifically, he said, I wanted to go to the Boston University School of Medicine. Dorison, who clearly was no dummy, knew that that school was doing research on the damage that football players' brains were experiencing, and he wanted them to look at his brain. So, the neurologist at the school did an autopsy, and they later confirmed what he thought. He had suffered from neurodegenerative disease, and they linked it to the concussions he had experienced during his career in football. So, at least in one unfortunate sense, he did it in his career. All of this talk about injuries and, and pain and stuff like that, whatever the team you might have heard for, I think it can best be summed up by the words of another player, Joe Namath, superstar quarterback also, and another guy who saw his share of injuries in his career. The human body, Joe said, just wasn't meant to take the punishment for the game of football. This is out. Now, before I continue, there's a couple of quick things I need to touch on. One of those is money, because as we all know, the players make a lot of money, they're very well paid, and some people will tell you, well, with all that money they get, it's no big deal with the injuries and the other things they deal with. And it's true, football players are pretty well paid much. The median salary of a player today is about $770,000. That is no small chunk change. The downside is, the average player's career is only going to last about three years. That is not a lot of time to save up to care for your wife, your kids, save for their college, and the 25 years or so of disability that you're going to have. Oh, and when the great John United's requested disability compensation from the NFL, they turned him down. The league said the rules require that you have to apply by age 55. Johnny said, but my arm didn't start hurt until I was 60. Too bad. So now Johnny's pension from the NFL is a big fat $4,000 a month. And Dave Kukur, the guy that tried to shave his, uh, brush his teeth with his razor, the most he ever made was $35,000 a season. I also want to touch really quick on college football. Because I know a lot of people say, well, I don't like a pro game. But I do like college, it's a little less tainted, it's a little more pure, and I like the fun. So a couple of quick things on that. First, here's how the NCAA treats their athletes. There's a wrestler from the University of Minnesota, I you listening over there, Stephen? Yeah, I Who recently lost his eligibility. The reason is because he had made and recorded an inspirational video encouraging kids to stay in school and make good choices. And then he had the audacity to put it on YouTube and iTunes. For that, the NCA banned him because they say their rules are that you cannot use your net name or likeness to sell any type of commercial product, even if it's a song of inspiration or motivation. And on a broader perspective, because I think many parents at some point say, oh, I wonder if my kid could make it to the pros. Well, here's the, here's the chances on that. The NFL has something called the Scouting Combine, and that's where they bring together all the players who they think they might have a chance of being drafted. Each year, the number they invite to that is only about 215 players. That means it's less than 3% of all the college players, and less than 0.2% of all the high school players. So in other words, the typical college player probably has a better chance of suffering a debilitating injury than he or does out of making it to the pros. And that, by the way, is exactly what happened to a former University of Rutgers player. In 2010, a guy named Eric Legrand was trying to make a tackle. He hit the guy wrong, did damage to his uh, two vertebrae, and today he's virtually dead. But it's not just the impact on football and the participants. 
I also wonder about the impact it has on us. Now, this is really a dicey topic here. And I know that, especially in the Unitarian Church, history is filled with well intentioned people, usually conservatives, who spend all their time going around worrying about what other people are doing. And get them to stop and do it, they will say all sorts of crazy stuff, which you all have heard. Masturbation will lead to memory loss. Working women are going to destroy the family. I can call this the devil's work. Masturbation will lead to memory loss. <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to tread lightly here. Especially since my thoughts are up against some pretty big names from academia. For example, the chairman of Harvard's philosophy department has said he thinks it's okay to watch football as long as the serious injuries, the really bad ones, are not an essential part of the game, but rather just a side effect. And another philosophy professor in Notre Dame, who's also the director of their Center for Ethics and Culture, he's defending football too. He says we shouldn't feel bad about watching a game just because it has some serious injuries. And he's added for good measure, there are worse things about me than that I enjoy watching a game that has violence in it. Well, okay. But other academics have taken a different perspective. For example, there are the researchers who found that after England lost to Germany in the 2006 World Cup, the reports of domestic violence increased like 31%. This has also been looked at by a couple of guys who are actually economists named David Card and Gordon Dow. They took a totally different category, but they looked at the same thing. Football, domestic violence. So what they thought is, yes, indeed, there is a correlation. We find a 10% increase in post-game violence from, but that the man is committing on his wife, the woman, but only when his team was expected to win. If the team was not expected to win, they found no correlation in violence. So if you're a cowboy saying that's really cool because our team never wins, so we don't have to worry about that. They're always expected to win. Exactly. And away from academia and all this research is the perspective of the people who work on the front lines, people who work at domestic violence hotline. Anecdotally, many of them will tell you football games and Super Bowl Sunday are terrible. Very, very busy days. And one of them specifically, the woman who is the director of training at the um, Domestic Violence Center in Houston, on Super Bowl Sunday, she says she brings in extra staff to accommodate all the calls, and she keeps them there for the next five, six days after the game is over. She's prepared for the calls. I have not written a research paper since the days before Wikipedia. So it's a lot harder for me now. And I don't feel qualified to judge any of the researchers who have different perspectives. So I just try to approach this from a little more simplistic angle. One of these is what I refer to as my cinema theory. You probably heard of that station. And I'm sure your parents will appreciate this. That's the station that you never let your kids watch because it's got so much sense, so much violence, and all those Mel Gibson movies. <laughs> and I totally get where you're coming from. Apocalypto terrible too. But it also makes me wonder, if we're going to be concerned about the entertainment things that we expose our kids to, maybe we should also wonder about the sports program that we let them see as well. And I also have a second theory, this one I really like a lot. I call this my theory of T.O. Now, if you know for a football fan, you know the T.O. stands for Terrell Owens. That's his nickname. Um, and you've probably seen he's a pretty childish player. He's selfish, he's arrogant. I have seen sponges that are messed up until <laughs> And I love to see T.O. get hit. The harder the better, man. If he were to get knocked out of the game, it would be no skin off my nose, so to speak. But I also have to wonder what it says about me that I take pleasure in seeing him get hit. And I have to wonder would he be so, how he would feel if he knew how interested I am in seeing what happens to his well being. Who knows who's going to get the skin? But anyway. 
Uh, Kip Meyer, the Dutch historian I mentioned earlier, he's written a book on gladiators. And in that book, he tells an anecdote about a Roman youth who was mentored by the great theologian Augustine. Augustine had specifically talked to the youth about the lure of the Colosseum and the gladiator games. And the young man resolved to go and see for himself and say, I'm going to watch this from a detached point of view. But as the young man later recalls it, it was not long before he found himself caught up in the excitement too. He's in there cheering, jeering, and right along with the rest of the crowd. Now Meyer, to his credit, does not disappoint the young man. Rather, he turns around and says, who am I to say that I, that I too would have been capable of resisting the appeal of the Colosseum? Fair question. Who are we to say we can resist the appeal of this evening today? So while I would never assert that Washington football has coarsened any of us, I'm not so sure I would be willing to say that it has made us more compassionate. By the way, I've been missing out football here for a good chunk of time. Please don't think I am oblivious to football's many redeeming qualities. As the great coach Vince Lombardi told us, football is like life. It requires perseverance, sacrifice, dedication, respect for authority. Country music star Jamie Chesney told us that football tells us that football taught him how important it is to work hard to achieve your goals. And one player, former player, has said flat out, Football saved my life. So I don't question that football can teach us some very good values. But I do wonder if maybe we couldn't learn those, uh, those same qualities elsewhere. Other sports can teach us about perseverance, sacrifice, and dedication without some of the risks of football. Other sports might make us smarter, too. In fact, former Major League player Jim Bowden, he says point blank baseball players are smarter than football players. After all, he says, have you ever seen a baseball team get penalized for having too many guys on the field? Good point. Okay, so now I have laid out this incredibly well-researched, profoundly articulate, moving argument. What do we do? Well, just to be clear, I am not advocating that we ban football. Yes, I think that any attempt to ban football would only cause the game to go into hiding and seek refuge underground, kind of like we all did during the Bush administration years. <laughs> so my suggestion is a bit more modest. You know, you use, we are an incredibly thoughtful bunch in how we spend our time and how we spend our money. We buy organic produce. We buy a fair share of coffee. We buy hybrid cars. <coughs> we, buy, we buy free range chicken, or no chicken at all. And many of us can name at least one company, if not companies, where we refuse to patronize them. We don't like the politics, how they treat their employees, we don't like what they do to the environment. And even if, after all these years, I still will not like the asset that's on them because of what happened with the oil spill. I am fortunate, though, that I have the loving support of my good wife, Caroline, in this cause, especially the car needs ocean. So, in short, we give a lot of thought to the impact our choices make. For our lives, for the lives of others, for what we perceive as the greater community. And really, that's all I would ask you to do to football. Are we really sure there's nothing a little unsettling about the delight that people take when they see one player crash into another? Are we positive the players are being fairly compensated for their work? What is the fair compensation for someone who is crippled? What about for someone who's left a permanent dimension? You know, I'm trying to be a vegetarian. I'm working real hard on it. It's some success. And every now and then I'll talk to carnivores and try to make a case about it. And at some point I'll bring up the little messy business about how the animals are raised and slaughtered and all that kind of stuff. If you've ever had that conversation, what you'll almost always hear the person say is, I know, I just try not to think about it. Now, you know that's never going to satisfy the needs. Is it the other satisfied But it does. But it does raise a really good point for us as you use. If we're going to be concerned about the ethics of where meat comes from, if we're worried about where our flowers are grown and how our cocoa is harvested, 
Shouldn't we also give you some real concern about the process that produces our football players? Why would we spend more time thinking about how animals are slaughtered, about the pain a plant might bear experience, than not about what people are experiencing? Now, there's a way to rationalize all this, of course. Some people would say that sports is just like any other profession. It can have, there's great physical parallel. I mean, just try being a UU minister. But it also may be that few other sports are based on having humans repeatedly inflict pain and damage on each other. And those other sports are the ones that many of us would not approve of anyway. Or we can be like the Notre Dame professor who says, I don't get into the violence, I just love the game for its teamwork, for the incredible athleticism, for the drama. But to me, that's kind of like saying, well, I'm not into CO2 emissions, I just like driving around. And we can tell ourselves that these young men, guys 18, 19 years old, who are so eager to prove themselves for the chance to achieve riches and glory, they know what they're getting into. Well, I'm not so sure about that. I hope that you'll keep that in mind. Someday maybe your uh, high school son or daughter comes up to you with a diploma in hand and says, Mom, Dad, I am ready to get married now. And you're going, hmm, I don't know about that. Maybe you should play some pro football first. <laughs> So now for me, when I watch a game, and yes, I do still watch games, I just make it a point to try to think about more than just the score, the players, and the stats. I try to think about the influence that football might be having on me, on the athletes, maybe even on our culture. And I try to think whether we really are that far removed from the days of the gladiators. I wonder if given the chance they might have had a certain and I try to think about the recent survey in which 90% of the players they talked to said, heck yes, I'm glad I played that game. I enjoyed it. It was awesome. But less than half of those same players said, I want my kids to play this game too. And last, I try to keep in mind the words of Kurt Marsh. That's the lineman I mentioned earlier, the guy that got his foot amputated at the shin. Here's how he described his experience as a pro player. When I, first came, when I came to my first NFL camp, I was like a tall, cold can of beer. They popped the top, and all that energy and desire and ability poured out. I gave of myself with the same passion that I had in high school and in college. And when I was empty, when I had no more to give, they just crumpled me up and threw me on the garbage. Then they grabbed another can, new can and popped him over, and he flowed out. So he was As I tried to make clear, I'm still very much in love with football. But after all these years, I'm beginning to wonder if maybe the relationship isn't really so healthy for me. So, thinking about breaking up. <laughs> it's going to go slow, and to be honest, I don't think I'll ever really be over it. And I, you know, I kind of think that's how I want it to. I know we're going to still see each other every once in a while, and I really hope we can stay friends. And I hope all of you stay friends with football, too. It truly really is a great game. It has many wonderful qualities to offer, entertaining as heck to watch. I just hope that the next time you hear that TV blare, are you ready for some football? Before you answer, take a moment and make sure you're Rise and rise for the